I wanted to <coughs> welcome you to our very first in the series of Native Voices lectures. And this is a lecture on Aspen Trees and Toothaches, Pre-Columbian Healing Practices of North American Indian Indigenous People by Francie Lynn Taylor, who is Choctaw, and she is director of the American Indian Resource Center which is part of the Office for Student Equity and Diversity here at the University of Utah. Francie um, is, specializes in traditional indigenous knowledge and ethnobotany, and is a participating member of the Indigenous Peoples Working Group at the United Nations. She's taught classes on interactions between colonialism and indigenous peoples at the University of Brussels in Belgium, and she's um, a traditional dancer and a craft worker. So please uh, join me in welcoming Francie Lynn Taylor. Nesh, Halito, Tanse, Pabaisiva, hello, Hulton Morgan. I'm just addressing you and welcoming you in some of the various different areas and places that I've been. I have taught in Europe for eight years, primarily at the University of Leiden. I'm originally from Montana. I'm a mother, a grandmother, um, a respectful niece of some incredibly wonderful aunties. And aunties is a honorific where I come from. It doesn't have anything to do with biology. That brings me back to what I'm talking about, aspen trees and toothaches, because first let me tell you what I'm not going to do. My background when I was an undergraduate and in graduate school and when I was working on my PhD was about traditional healing, what it is and what it isn't. So what I am not going to tell you, I will not describe for you how to make a tincture. I will not tell you how to harvest specific plants. I will not indicate what a specific plant is used for or how you can replicate it because that has nothing to do with native healing. Native healing is about balance. Traditionally, if you went to someone in your community to say, or they came to you and said, I don't know, I can't sleep, I've got stomach ache, I can't, I'm just really having trouble, they would never say, well, we can, produ we can give you this plant or that plant. You would start off by saying, so how's things with your wife and kids? What's going on in your life? What's troubling? What have you been doing lately? Because health is holistic. It's about balance. It's about staying in the middle. And so I'm giving you more of an overview of the things that I've been taught and instructed by the aunts and grandparents that are in my life. I, under no circumstances, consider myself an expert. I'm still a learner. I'm still just beginning this journey of trying to understand who I am and my relationship to medicine. So I am just going to share some things with you. Willows, aspens, acacias. There's a reason why I start my presentation about this. Because the willows have both metaphorically and biologically have a relationship to humans and to healing. If you take any of the silicon plants and ingest the bark or the buds or the leaves, when they hit your stomach and combine with the stomach acid, <clears throat> they become a little thing called acetosalicylic acid. And hopefully most of you know what that is. It's aspirin. And it was used pre-Columbian times for all of the reasons that we prescribe aspirin today. Painkiller, blood thinner, uh, all of those things. Amgesics, everything you use. And, but on the other hand, the other side of the willow tree and aspens and others, these are communal plants. They exist, support each other in a communal way. An aspen grove is basically an individual organism. All of the roots underneath the ground are connected in the same way that our families connect within our communities in the traditional 
Native community. The other and perhaps the most important thing about the willows and the aspens, <coughs> willows in particular are probably one of the most diverse and complex plants that a botanist could ever approach. They are the things that PhDs are made of because they are so diverse. This relates directly to American Indian, Native American, indigenous communities because when I'm teaching a class, I always say, if you come out of this knowing only three things about indigenous people, American Indian people, those three things should be diversity, diversity, diversity. We are not a sum one. We are vastly different within our communities. Even in an individual community, an individual sovereign nation, we have as much diversity as is experienced outside our community. So even when I'm going into something talking about healing or anything else like that, it is extremely individual to what I've been taught, and it does not extend to anyone else. One of the reasons why I will not tell you how to make some of the medicines that I've been taught is that you need to know where the plant was grown first. If in Montana we have some absolutely beautiful willows that in the autumn are brilliant, they have the brightest reds and oranges you've ever seen, mainly because they're glowing on mine tailings. They are dense with mercury, lead, and other toxic metals. Never use those. You also need to know what part of the plant you're going to harvest. When I was growing up, we ate something called pemmican. Pemmican is this amazing food that never goes stale. It will last forever. It's made up of ground choke cherries, what we call mins, which is the original plant, the original berry. And it is delicious. It's dried and ground, mixed with bone fat and powdered dried meat. It is an acquired taste. <laughs> I guarantee you. Point is, all seeds that exist in a pit can be poisonous. They contain arsenic. This is why we get laetrile from peach pits and apricot pits. Children have died from eating as many as five or six, seven of the seeds in chokecherry. They are extremely toxic. The one thing that removes the toxin is vitamin D. So when they're dried and crushed and left in the sunlight, they become a nutritious food source. But you absolutely have to know what part of the plant, when to harvest it, how to treat it, when to administer it. And so these are things that take lifetimes to learn. In the beginning, where I come from and in my family, everything is divided up in fours. When I'm doing a presentation, I always try to divide things into fours. Three makes a triangle. It's not balanced. Four makes a square or a circle, which is always in balance. The circle is one of our other key symbols. It has no beginning, no end. Although, if you'll notice in my medicine wheel there, there is an opening. There is an opening, but it's more like a spiral that never ends. Almost all of the knowledge that I am trying to, to learn comes from grandmothers or aunties. Grandma's lessons. Originally, our, most of our societies were matriarchal. We took who we are, the stuff who we are. When I say that my real name, the name that I know myself by, as Kasawasit Kita Pahasukiskoyo, is a name that was given to me in a ceremony when my aunties were there to tell me what my name was. It is a blessing, and it tells me my job 
description, what my responsibilities are. In a very Levi Straussian sort of way, you know that if you have a paternity suit between two identical male twins, you're going to have difficulty establishing which one's the father because they were a single cell that split. If you are present at the time of birth, it is really difficult to argue who the mother is. And so in an ancient way, a very sui generis, generic way, matrilines made perfect sense. Within this, we always maintain the circle and the balance. Trying to keep things, never try to be all good because we stay in the middle. Things that are on either side tend to topple. And so even in healing, it's important to get the person back into balance before you can identify or deal with the symptoms. Fours are forever. When I was grown up, we were told that there's four seasons, four areas of life, four basic elements. Those four basic elements are fire. As people in medicine, you know, if somebody gets cold, there's a problem. When the heat goes out, the person no longer exists on this plane. There's water. Water is the basis of where the willow grows in, coming back to the willow. The human body has almost the same percentage of water as the earth does. Earth, we believe that we were originally stardust that fell to earth. Interesting enough, modern physioscience now says that we are stardust that fell to earth. Imagine that. And air. One of the things that I struggle with probably more than anything else is the utilization and the proper management of air. As my auntie often tells me, and has for many, many years, air is one of the four sacred elements. You cannot produce sound without utilizing air. Air is sacred. Therefore, choose your words carefully. And remember that you are using sacred air to say these words. If you use your words to harm someone, to criticize someone, to bring someone down, you have violated the compact between the creator who gave you the sacred air. There's four ages. Well, again, coming back to the willow, we use the willow or the cottonwood tree to define the four ages of humanity. First, you have the little sprout. The little sprout is really important because that can be formed, bent, corrupted. So we believe you always take the most care of that little sprout when it's first coming up. As a young plant, it develops the branches and the leaves that it will use later. As a full-grown tree, it provides the safety and the shelter for all of those that gather around it all of the animals of the earth. And as an old cottonwood tree that sheds its branches, it provides the warmth and the wisdom that nourishes the baby sprout. It goes on and on forever. We also look at the four directions, which are not cardinal directions, and the four colors that go with them. We use red, black, or in the old days, it was a dark blue, yellow, and white. Respect and responsibility is one of the other things that we focus on that has to do with, as in a medical environment, do no harm. When you are dealing with people, especially in this day and age, I hear almost daily about what rights students and people have. We have the right of free speech. I hear that one a lot. My aunties and elders would say, no, you have a responsibility to never allow your words to harm someone else. So rights do not exist separately from responsibility. And we're back to that balance. Jobs and community. In traditional societies, there was no 
a doctor. Everybody had special skills. Everybody had special responsibilities. And it overlapped. So now let's look at some medicinal things. Because I also want to leave some time to, to uh, have some questions. Does anybody know what this plant is? Echinacea. We call it mankta, the bushy-headed person. <laughs> so here's some plants that we used medicinally. Willow was our number one. It's like I said, it has so many metaphorical reasons that you use it. Um, let's see here. The blood thinner, etc. Purple coneflower, mankta. This is a plant that was used for colds. It was used for wounds. It was used as a tonic in the spring. When it was gathered, you can use, actually you can use every part of the echinacea plant and make tea or anything else of it. One of the things that, if it's strongest in the root, when we gathered it, we never pulled the plant up. When we gather echinacea, and we still do in Montana around this time of year, most of our root plants are gathered in the late fall. Most of our root plants, it's best to gather them after the first frost. With echinacea, it has a very unusual kind of two-pronged taproot with long runners that come out of it. You never take more than half of it. And you always mark the plant to show which one that you took from. Because it will grow back the second year and flower, but it no longer will have a medicinal use. One of the reasons that echinacea is controversial is because very often they're only using the leaves and the flowers, or they dig up the whole plant when they harvest it. And very often this means the plant has already lost all of its medicinal properties. So you very carefully dig it, take half of the root, give it water, give it some food, and replant it so that it can come back again. Yarrow. It's also called squirrel tail. The word we have for it means bushy one. It's um, millif Achilles millifluorum. It is believed this is a worldwide plant. This is one that did not exist only in North America. It's worldwide. And in ancient Greek times, it's believed that it was the sap of the yarrow that Achilles was dipped into to make him impervious. The unique thing about yarrow is that the fresh crushed plant stems blood flow. And it stems it not by constricting the capillary. It just restricts the blood flow. It's used for wounds. It's also used as a tea and as a sedative. Burdock. This is not the same thing as a cockle burr. This has the big burrs on it that are so annoying. I picked it strictly because it is a plant that's in Utah. It's in my yard. It's um, often mixed with sarsaparilla root. The root of the burdock is mixed, and it's used for coughs and stomach aches. It's very soothing. Part of why a lot of the original medicines for sore throats, et cetera, were successful is that they were almost always mixed with raw honey. And we also know the medicinal purposes of raw honey and the fact that it soothes the throat. When I was little, I remember my, my grandmother's favorite cure for a sore throat was to have us drink jello water that had been sweetened with honey. And I think it was probably more the honey than anything else, but it works great. Try it if you have small children. Thin jello water works great. Um, Butterfly milkweed. If you've ever seen these, these, and I know they're here, they grow on the road near where I'm, my home is. It has the big, huge, multi-flowered pink flowers on it. You have to be very careful. You have to have a special knife to harvest it with. Because once you get the sap on a knife, you have to use something like acetone to get it off. 
and it was the original chewing gum. You can dry it and chew it, but it also was the original Band-Aid that we used. And it has a very antiseptic uh, property to it. It will draw the poison out of a wound, but it also closes it. So milkweed with yarrow is a great emergency medicine for small wounds. I have seen it work. I had a friend that absolutely did not believe me, and he had this oozing sore where he'd cut himself out camping. And I said, oh, here, let me take that. And I put some, I actually use something that's called oyster root, which is salsify. It looks like the great big dandelions, but it has the same lactase, or the uh, latex type sap. Put it on him, and about the next morning, it fell off. And you could already see that the skin was healing underneath it. Works wonders. Stinky, not very nice, but it works. Buffalo gourd is something that we use for almost everything, from stomach ache, the powdered vine of it for earaches, everything. Um, you probably don't know it. It's not readily available in Utah. It looks like a tiny squash and has little round squash balls that end up being hollow gourds. We also use them in some of our dance ceremonies. But every part of the plant was utilized. Gumweed is um, a different type of a, a latex-based plant, also used for upper respiratory problems. <coughs> Mint. And I put the the word that we use mint by, which I won't translate because it has a very graphic description of flatulation. <laughs> <laughs> but this is what it was used for. Mint is great. It's also called square box plant because you can tell mints immediately because they have a square stem. But it's a stomach relaxant, digestive aid. It cures bad breath. It makes a wonderful tea and was widely used. There are hundreds of kinds of mint, and they all work to some degree or another. Our most uh, widely used mint is what's called horse mint, and it has the big purple flowers or bee balm, either one of those. Wild lily is another one, because this has great benefits for things like skin disorders, uh, scabs, anything like that that's bothering you, this will take care of it. However, the root of it, again, is toxic. This is another one where you absolutely have to know where it's grown and how to use it. Uh, planting is this weird little flat plant you see with the one single stem in it. They're very small. It's another one that crushed and chewed makes a great skin uh, conditioner and will close wounds. Thought I had a couple others there. Dandelion and mullen. I threw those two in for one purpose. Neither of these are pre-Columbian. Both the dandelion, which is an Eurasian plant, and mullen, which is uh, from the areas around England and the coast there, the lowlands, both were introduced as ornamentals. They are invasive plants that did not originate here. However, dandelion root is great for headaches. And mullen, within, when Lewis and Clark came west, they noted no mullen in the western areas. However, 20 years later, when Thwaites came through, he found it everywhere. Mullen is one of those plants that in, invades any disturbed soil. By the time Thwaites came through, the Plains Indian tribes were burning mullen leaves and inhaling the smoke as a uh, cure or a, to, to deal with the symptoms of asthma. Now, it's counterproductive to think that you could breathe in smoke to cure asthma. However, the plant leaf has a bronchodilator in the chemical of the plant leaf. 
how did they know this? This is a question that I'm more frequently asked than anything else is, how did people know this? Having a clue. Can't tell you. Other than we watch the bears. Generally speaking, anything a bear eats, if you see a bear that's got diarrhea and they eat a particular plant, it probably will work for humans. So it's observational. I often have people say, well, it must have been trial and error. My answer to that is one of the plants that's most widely utilized in California is the acorn. Acorn meal is found in almost every California group as a primary food source. Acorns are coated in a tannin that is toxic. If you eat raw acorn meal, you die. So how do you prepare it? You leach it, wash it, boil it, and after the far fourth washing, hey, we're back to the number four, it's edible. So as a parent, I never would have gotten to the point where I could prove that this was edible because I only have two children. <laughs> and I'm not really sure if I served something to my family and one of them died, I would say, perhaps if I boil it again, it'll be okay. <laughs> this is knowledge that we just accept. It is not knowledge that we can justify or quantify by this is the process to get there. These are just things that we knew and that were passed on. We tend, it's unfortunate, probably one of the most unfortunate things about our society today is the fact that we diminish the knowledge of elders. We live in a society that's consumed with wanting to be 18 forever. We didn't feel that way. To this day, when I accept an opportunity, like in October, I've been asked to speak at the United Nations Higher Education Consortium. Before I go, I ask the permission and the blessing of my aunties. It's something that we adhere to. If you can live to be 100, you had to know something. And we should cherish that. Food stuff. And we're going to go through the rest of this relatively quickly so we've got some time left. But 80% of all food that's commercially grown in the United States today was unknown prior to Columbus and other colonization. We'll look at some of them. Maize. Corn. Corn is the Latin word that means grain. So if you've ever heard any old Irish songs when they talk about barley corn as a metaphor for whiskey, they're saying barley grain. Even in Europe today, if you go and look for corn, you're going to end up with wheat or oats or barley. They all call maize maize. Maize is an interesting plant in the fact that it is biologically impossible for it to have existed without human intervention. It originated with a grass that had one seed on it. It was cross-bred multiple times over multiple generations to end up with the corn that plants we have today. Every single variety of corn known today, there's an example of it in Peruvian times. So it's absolutely a miracle plant. It also is one of the three sisters. We have corn, beans, and squash. All three of those were unknown. There were two beans known worldwide prior to colonization, the mung and the soy, other than all the other beans that came from the Americas. Corn was always planted with beans and squash. Corn grows first. The pole beans call the corn stalk, and the squash leaves protect it from weeds and, and keep moisture in the ground. They are the perfect symbiotic relationship. If you live on a diet of nothing but corn, you end up with a disease that's called pellagra. It is considered a mental disease where people go crazy. One of the justifications for the enslavement of African American people was the fact that generations of being fed in the slave camps nothing but corn, very many people went insane. And so that was used as a justification as they were less mentally stable. 
When corn is combined with beans, you end up with stasis. The nitrogen in the beans neutralizes the enzyme in the corn, and you hit equal. Add squash and a meat, and you have a perfect meal. The unfortunate thing is that because corn was cheap to grow, it was the food of choice by the slave owners, who ultimately probably didn't have their people under their control's best interest at heart to start with. Um, nightshades. Does anybody know about deadly nightshade? It's one of those little beautiful plant, gorgeous plant. When it goes to seed, it has really cute little pepper-like things on it. That's because it's a pepper. It's like a Caspian. All of the potatoes, tomatoes, peppers come from this genus. They were unknown. If you ordered a pizza in 1491, you would have gotten bread and cheese. We did not have cheese. Thank you for colonization. <laughs> I love cheese, so. Um, tomatoes, potatoes, all of those. The upper plant is poisonous. You cannot eat the top of a potato. In fact, a potato that grows above ground, that green part of it, is inedible. You shouldn't eat it. It can make you very sick. Uh, Captains, that's all of the peppers, the sweet peppers. Black pepper. If you talk about Marco Polo and the slave tr or the spice trade, they are talking only about black peppercorn. That was the original spice. In most old journals, when they speak of spice, they're talking about pepper. <coughs> Everybody had salt. Some of the other ones that were unknown, amaranth, quinoa, love quinoa, sunflower seeds. Sunflower seeds were used to divide up property, and yes, despite lots of myths. American Indian people did have a concept of the ownership of land. I'm teaching a class right now, and I've had several people say, well, Indian people didn't think you could own land. I had this asked of me once in a lecture like this, and I asked the lady if she had any children, and she said yes. And I said, would you like to sell one of them to me? I need a household servant. And she said, well, of course not. And I said, why? Doesn't she belong to you? And she went, oh, ownership means that this is a relationship. It is a relative of yours. It does not mean that you can commodify it and sell it. So Indian people absolutely had an idea concept of ownership, but not that the land could be sold for something so incorporeal as papal money. That was the difference. Agave. And it has more uses. It's, it's one of those multi-use. It could be eaten. It could be used medicinally. It could be made into tequila. <laughs> Peanuts, again, saute sauce, my favorite. Peanuts is associated with African food. But it came from the Americas, was transported to Africa, and then came back. The one plant that was brought from Africa that never went back was sugarcane. And it was imported to Brazil in the late 1490s because it was so difficult to, to harvest. So many of the Indian people that were forced to try to harvest it died. That the solution for that was the initiation of one of the darkest periods of the Americas because the plant came from Africa, because sugar is the most addictive substance we know. It was a high <coughs> produce, high commodity crop. In, six, in 1516, the first slave ship left Africa to go to Brazil for the sole purpose of harvesting and growing sugar. Um, pineapple. Pineapple did not come from Hawaii. Pineapple was taken to Hawaii by a Catholic priest who stole it from South America. And when he got to Hawaii, Chris quit the priesthood because he was being sent to the leper colonies, opened up the first large pineapple plantation in the Hawaiian Islands, and went back to his father's name of Dole. Chickley, maple. Actually, the original Iroquois had 
Cracker Jacks, no toy that we can document, but pre-Columbian graves did have a form of Cracker Jacks where they mixed nuts, popped corn, and maple syrup together and dried it. Vanilla, ground cherries, wild plums, and mustard are all things that would not have been known. If you lived in Europe and were not royalty in 1490, your three meals a day would have been a thin gruel of oatmeal soup augmented by a few wild vegetables and if you could sneak one without getting caught the periodic rabbit or squirrel ceremonial thank you dr lopez we had a blessing ceremony for the incoming students uh, who are going into the health sciences and i had one student come in a few days after we'd had the ceremony where they were given a little pouch that had sage, sweet grass, cedar, and tobacco. Rosebush is substituted for the cedar when you go farther north. But the student came in and was in tears because she did not think the University of Utah was welcoming or accepting. And that one little medicine pouch made her say, someone here understands. Someone here wants me to be here and decided she was at the point of going home and she decided to stay so it's with my deepest gratitude that dr lopez facilitated this multiple usage these are things you can use we've talked about before willow choke cherry tobacco the original tobacco had a minute fraction of the nicotine that tobacco has today wild roses yucca wavy leaf thistle cow parsnip interesting because it has multiple uses from food to uh, medicinal it's one that I tell people if they say, is that a cow parsnip I'll say nope don't look like it to me because it is almost identical to hemlock those of you who know about Socrates know about hemlock and it is hemlock is so deadly that if you cut it with a knife there's enough of the toxin on that knife that can make you seriously if not deadly ill uh, blue flax, irises, again, portions of it can be used. Others are deadly poisonous. Um, cottonwood, buffalo berry, amaranth, cattails. Cattails were the original pillow stuffings, along with deer, deer hair. Also make great mats out of them. And the, the root of it tastes a lot like a potato. Um, indigo, well, I'm missing some. Cockleburr, cockleburr was the... the uh, prototype for Velcro. Uh, seriously, the man that, that created Velcro had gotten things stuck together with cockle burrs and thought, hey, this would make a nice closure. And in old days, it was used for that. Very often, it was used to hold clothing together. Flax for material. Garlic. Garlic is worldwide. Hops. Where would college students be without the discovery of hops? <laughs> Horsetail, which is a grass that has two stages, male and female, is used. It has silica in it. It was often used for urinary tract infections, but it's kind of like drinking ground glass, so I'm not sure that I would ever suggest it. Indigo was the basis of much of the commerce out of the southeast. Juniper. Juniper makes a very, very effective cough syrup with the berries. I made some from my mom because with her high blood pressure, she ended up with the same scratchy throat that I have from it and was always coughing. So I made her some juniper berry tea. And one of her friends asked her, she said, did it work? And she says, it works amazingly. And she says, so it just stops your cough? And my mom said, no, it tastes so bad you're afraid to cough again. <laughs> Mallows, prickly pear, shepherd's purse is one of the seeds that we used, and ursa herba or bearberry. And that's it. This is our honor dance for some of the people that I'm so honored to work with that happened at the end of the powwow last year. And I see Chalmer there in the background. So, any questions? <laughs> yes, sir. 
I'm David Bonds. I've been delivering babies for about 15 years. You delivered one of my students, <laughs> former students. Oh. And it's been my privilege to work with the Native Americans for off and on for a number of years. In 1967, I was in northern Saskatchewan with the, uh, the Cree and the Cinnabon. Yeah. And then a little later, uh, with the Micmac in Nova Scotia, ah. <clears throat> and with the Sioux in South Dakota, and with the Blackfoot in Montana. And you mentioned um, 1805, which was a particularly interesting year for me. <clears throat> you know, I'm originally from London, as you might be able to tell. But England was having a tough time with France because Napoleon was taking over the whole of Europe, not unlike uh, Hitler. And there was, um, <clears throat> there was Nelson trying to fight back against uh, um, uh, Napoleon with these uh, 180 gun vessels, you see. Meanwhile, in, this was in 1805. Meanwhile, in 1805 in Montana, there's Meriwether um, <coughs> Lewis and uh, William Clark kind of sailing uh, down the uh, Yellowstone River and, and the Missouri. And of course, as you know, he meets uh, uh, Sakagawa, except that she's pregnant. And um, three weeks after she's uh, been with them, uh, she goes into labor. And uh, she's having a hard time uh, getting this uh, baby to her. And you remember her, <coughs> her husband, uh, um, Saint Saint Charbonneau, said uh, she needs rattlesnake rattle. Now, as it happened, <coughs> Captain Lewis had in his pouch some rattlesnake rattle. Now, he was very careful to document everything he did mm. on this uh, Lewis and Clark uh, trip. And apparently, the rattlesnake rattle worked very well in getting her on through her labor, getting mm -hmm. her over the pain, and out came this wonderful boy. So my question to you, well, before I pose the question, is <clears throat> that I had a chance in Montana, again, where you came from, to go hunting, or rather, actually, I was with the wounded warriors. And on the way back, ah. uh, I was with the bus, <coughs> and across our path, and we were going on the same track as um, as Lewis and Clark, as a matter of fact, the Milk River and, uh, and the trail. And we saw the rattlesnake going across our path. It, now, Lewis and Clark have documented very carefully that they had seen a two-foot rattlesnake. Well, this was a four-foot rattlesnake. And without realizing, the nurse had pulled out a nine millimeter uh. rattlesnake, and we had rattlesnake that night. And, but the interesting thing is, he, two days later, he presented me with the skin that was attached to the rattle. Now, the rattle was still in operation. Mm -hmm. And it seems to me that even a live snake, the rattle, would have to be very dry anyway. So my question, of course, comes to you. How does rattlesnake rattle encourage a delivery and take away the pain that Sakagawa apparently experienced? I think that would be a great <laughs> research project. <laughs> <laughs> we would use blue cohosh. It's one of the things like, one of the, well, you could lose blue cohosh or licorice. And licorice is, is another one of those plants with a plethora of uses, from chewing the, the roots to the plant. Um, it's widely available in Europe now, but it was an American plant. It is something that you absolutely should not consume if you have high blood pressure, if you are pregnant, or if you're going through menopause, because it increases, it increases the effects of menopause. It has a very... Uh, it increase, increases the estrogen in your system when you're chewing it. So we would use licorice to bring on labor. But again, it was considered uh, an herb of last resort because it's very difficult to tell how strong it is. And it can have really negative. But blue cohosh was used a lot too in childbirth. But I've never heard of the rattlesnake rattle cure. I have always wondered why we talk so much about Lewis and Clark and the, the first white people that crossed the mountains and all of that, and ignore the fact that David Thompson had done it 25 years earlier. 
but was in Canada. So. Well, actually, uh, Henry Kelsey. Kelsey and, Saskatchewan yeah. In 1698. Yeah. Also, you know, befriended the Cinnaboy, the famed Indian in Korea at that time. And I got there 277 years later. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing people, yeah, yeah. I, another thing that's never told in history is that when Lewis and Clark came up, every one of their boatmen were part Indian. The men that brought them to the Mandan villages were all Omaha and Nebraska Indians. But any other questions? Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so for descendants of uh, settler colonizers, my question is, what do you think? What do you think is worse for the, them or us to do? Denigrate and ignore um, native medicine practices, or co-opt and capitalize off of them? Or do you think they're both two sides of the same coin? Or how do you move from there to a respectful? relationship. Oh boy. <laughs> I could I could really shake the tree on this one. If you want to be a physician, if that is your goal, the part of native traditional medicine that I would beg you to embrace is to divest thyself of thy ego and listen to the patient. Establish a relationship where you are listening to more than symptoms. Learn to treat the person, not the symptom. That, but that is absolutely my personal perspective. But one of the things that we are taught in higher education is to develop profound egos, that we are the end all. And it's something that even I struggle with daily to realize I am a tiny voice in a very large cacophony of valid stories. That's why I always stress, this is mine. This is my story. Don't interpolate this to anyone else. I'm talking about my experience. But I guess that would be it, is those two things can absolutely meet and, and be present. <coughs> Other questions? Yes, sir. I was going to say nomadic people would have to be aware of the conditions and the amount of things and times when things are available, be available because I thought of like, absolutely. melon is all, always available, available, but due to rain, there's about 10 times as much melon in, Eastern Colorado yeah. as usual. Right, right. right. And uh, myths and stereotypes, at least three-fourths of pre-Columbian people were at best semi-nomadic. All inhabitants of North America prior to colonization were traders. There were people, if you look at the history of Cahokia, there are elements that were found in Cahokia from every part of North America, from Canada to the Gulf Coast to Mexico. If you've ever hunted the arrowheads, you find yep. stones from all over. In Absolutely. And so people did have massive trade routes, but most people were agrarian. They, they were horticulturists. There are periods when they would go out and hunt for meat and bring it back, but the primary crops that were embraced were the three sisters, corn, beans, squash, sunflowers, shepherd's purse, and all those. Even if you go to some place like Africa, like Richard Lee did, to study the nomadic Kung Sang, you discover that 90% of the diet's plant. Meat is always of a higher status, but it's always of a lesser quantity. And so the, the concept of the horse-bound or horseback nomadic plains warrior lasted a little over 100 years only. So it's, people were much more semi-sedentary. Although people moved frequently because they also knew that land would wear out in about 10 to 15 years. And so every 10 or 15 years, you'd move to a new plot of land and reestablish your villages. So, other questions, comments, thoughts? Uh, yes? How did um, Native medicine men and women deal with 
mental and psychological power. Deal with mental and psychological power. <laughs> My sisters are speaking, telling me to be cautious. <laughs> yes. Part of my name relates to, to thunders. Um, cautiously, empathetically, um, without the assumption that they knew everything. It was about asking questions. But in, in traditional villages, communities that I'm related to, different people did different things. There wasn't an all-knowing, all-seeing family practice person. If you had a problem with you couldn't sleep, there might be an elder that you knew could handle that. But it wasn't separated out. There wasn't this practice and that practice. It was that to be healthy, all of it has to be healthy. If you have a stomach ache, it's probably only one time in a thousand caused by something you ate. So you have to address what's going on to get to the symptom. Does that answer your question at all? No. <laughs> there, wasn't a, there wasn't a specialty for psychological. Now, you had uncles or aunties. For, for men, you had an uncle. If you were doing something publicly that was considered antisocial, in our languages, we're, our language did not have first-person pronouns. We didn't say I, me, my. We said we, our, us. And so in that communal society, if you were doing something that was perceived as being egocentric or antisocial, an uncle would grab you and take you aside and say, I don't know why you're doing this, but it needs to stop now. And if it didn't, you could be expelled from the group. And very many, there are very many things that could happen where you would be, where you would have your name killed. And so let's say your name's Joe and you just ignore everybody and you complete, con continue to be antisocial behavior. They would have a meeting and announce to the community that Joe no longer rides lives amongst us, he has passed on. No one would kick you out, but no one would ever speak to you again. You could approach people and they would step aside and refuse. People would run from you rather than engage with you. And so that social stigma of being ostracized was powerful enough to mediate most bad behavior. People had sweat lodges, they had vision quests where you'd go four days without food and water, trying to establish what was causing you to be antisocial. So there wasn't a practice of psychology or mental problems, but there was a social mechanism that, that mediated that. So there wasn't a necessity to have a doctor that dealt with it. Did they associate these problems with, with spiritual if you have a child that's a really well-behaved behaved child and suddenly they start being really bad, it's easy to assume that something has taken control of them. And who are we in our highly scientific world to say that isn't true? Because they obviously have changed. And so, yes, spirit's possession was commonly attributed and there were ceremonies to deal with that but when somebody comes becomes asocial there's a reason for it other questions thoughts yes would you want to tell us what your name means no <laughs> <laughs> other than to say it 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 um, it tells me what my duties are and it states that i'm related to the thunder beans Mother's sisters, nope. or is that just complete any woman in the community? Is it's an honorific. It's an honorific of somebody who I give that level of respect and supervision over my actions. And 
we do not, my family does not practice what anthropologists call Eskimo kinship. I am not related to my father's sister in any way, shape, or form. In fact, my father's sister's children, I could marry if I wanted to. Even though in our society, people would go, that's your first cousin, not mine. And historically, there is no more uh, genetic problems in that than in the system we have here. Multiple marrying into genetically would cause some recessive genes to appear. But, but I'm not related because I'm from a different matriline and clan as my father. And so technically, I'm not related to my dad other than he's my dad. So my auntie is somebody that I give profound respect to. My auntie is somebody that I have no biological genetic relationship to. But if she says, don't do that, I don't do it. My auntie is, my primary auntie is the one that used to sit in the back of the room because I tend to be very circular in my mind. And it's very difficult for me to stay on a linear track. And she would be at the back of the room going, reel it in, Francie, reel it in. <laughs> she would do that to me too. But no, it's an honorific. Thank you so much, Francie. Thank oh, you all. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. And I, I just want